Here is a list of the number of political parties in the nations of the world. Most nations have a couple dozen parties, but just a few of them typically receive most of the votes. In effect, the U.S. has just two parties who maintain a shared monopoly. What is the difference between authoritarian and democratic systems? Democracy is a blending of views that partially satisfies everyone, while dictatorial governments have a single party with a single view of goals and priorities. This single party forces the nation down a single path by outlawing all other parties, views, and paths. Imagine how your nation would be quickly transformed if only a single party made all decisions without debate. For example, if the U.S. had only the Democratic Party or only the Republican Party, about half the citizens would be very happy and the other half would be very mad. Single party states are able to make more rapid decisions and are an effect more rapid change than is possible under the slow debate of multi-party states, but only some of its citizens are happy with the result. In an authoritarian state, there is but one view of the role and priorities of the state because all other views are outlawed. Anyone promoting alternative views is punished. The authoritarian state tries to control all political, economic, and social activity and has even become the leader's attempt for total mind control. Here is a list of several of the hundreds of petitions presented by U.S. citizens showing concern about any and all issues. In the single party state, no organization of any kind can be created without first obtaining the permission of the government. No organization is allowed to compete with the state or disagree with the state, or serve any function that the state is already providing. An approved group is given a meeting place and allowed to publicize its goals and events and to collect dues. Those persons taking part in any unauthorized organization that is attempting to be autonomous of the state will be either fined, jailed, or expelled from one's profession or from the country. These punishments usually keep the number of active dissidents very low. For about 45 years, from 1945 through 1990, the authoritarian communist governments of Eastern Europe tried to impose allegiance and to create citizens who, who would obey state directives and who would accept state-selected priorities and policies. But two generations was not enough time. Most Eastern Europeans felt that the imposed communist state was illegitimate and would only grudgingly take part in mandatory voting, state-sponsored social groups, and demonstrations of state support. Most persons believed that the state was unable to bring about needed changes. Daily opposition occurred as citizens were forced to find ways of circumventing state barriers just to obtain the needed resources that were constantly in scarce supply. As soon as the coercion ceased during Mikhail Gorbachev's reforms, the Eastern European states quickly dissolved. In the book Political Culture and Democracy in Developing Countries, edited by Larry Diamond, Christine Sadowski describes the role of illegal autonomous groups in organizing alternative ideas within the communist states of Eastern Europe. Group members used the same tactics that had been earlier developed by the underground in their struggles against the Nazis during World War II. They held meetings in private homes and, to get their message out to the public, would sneak into printing plants after hours or would resort to hand-typing copies of flyers. Various autonomous groups formed in response to a specific, well-defined issue, particular injustice or grievance such as wages, the availability of food, or the freedom of speech. 
They sometimes chose to publish a letter in a foreign journal, but the state would respond by forbidding any domestic journal to publish other works by those authors, and this meant an end to the author's professional career. The communist states inadvertently helped spread word of dissent groups when state-run news agencies published accounts of their arrests and conviction of dissidents. When the autonomous groups found that they were being allowed to come out into the open, they demanded official recognition to operate independently of the state. Their existence, accomplishment, and knowledgeable critiques of the state undermined the legitimacy of the state by publicly revealing its limitations. For example, citizens would ask themselves if the state already has the declared purpose of protecting workers' rights then why is a trade union needed? Group leaders gained public support, organizational experience, and were prepared to step in and take control as the states were being remade. The group's accurate information and open discussions brought change to the previously authoritarian nations, though the group members were but a small fraction of the nation's population. The autonomous groups laid the foundation for the fall of the authoritarian, single-party state by presenting the truth to the people, publicizing goals, demanding that rulers be held accountable, and making the rulers see that repression was futile. The falling states had then to choose between increasing repression against the increasing power of the autonomous groups as did Romania and the German Democratic Republic, or to dilute their own power by allowing the groups to represent alternative views, which meant moving toward a multi-party system. In communist Romania, the Ceausescu regime used the most extreme measures to crush the formation of dissident groups. Citizens would not criticize the government even during private conversations because everyone knew that, throughout the entire population, one in five persons was paid to inform on everyone else. To control the spread of alternative ideas, Ceausescu outlawed every means of mass printing, even typewriters, so secretaries were handwriting each copy of a document. Ceausescu's repression was so successful that when revolution came, Few persons had even heard of any dissidents, and this meant that there was no previously accepted leader waiting to take over control of the state. In 1983, I spent a month in Arad, Romania, on a business trip to set up multi-million dollar railroad car test equipment in an engineering lab. Arad is a town of 200,000 persons. Our hosts were very nice people who took us to their favorite weekend vacation spots. They prepared lunch for us every day so that we could sample home-style food. One of our hosts gave me a mathematics book. However, the Ceausescu government was performing poorly for its citizens. I saw firsthand how much that we citizens will put up with from a poorly functioning government. The government did not even have enough money to provide electricity for the downtown streets. Even the traffic lights were not operating. Since each person was rationed a few liters or a gallon of gas per month, horses were replacing automobiles. Shops were unlit. While eating at a restaurant with my host, a government agent appeared to photograph the Romanians who were socializing with Westerners. My host believed that this could be used against them in the future. As the government imposed more and more on their daily life, people continued to be concerned only that they could provide for their families. Laszlo Magyar from Hungary, who was also visiting there for business and became our friend, pointed out that if you are occupied each day with just obtaining the day's food, then you do not have time to worry about things like the freedom of the press. I learned that if our leaders of our governments do such a poor job that we have to walk 10 miles per day for daily water, then we will just walk 10 miles per day for water. 
we will not resort to violent revolt unless there is no water or food. By the way, this makes me doubt the usefulness of placing economic sanctions against the people of a nation to attempt to pressure its leader into conforming to foreign wishes. During a protest in 1989, Ceausescu ordered his generals to shoot to kill. 100 persons were killed in an anti-government rally of 100,000 persons. Ceausescu then bust in workers to take part in a pro-government rally, but the participants were not fooled. When their chants drove Ceausescu from a balcony during his televised speech, it showed the national audience that he was no longer to be feared. Within four days, his government had been toppled, and he had been arrested and executed. Sadowski explains that 40 years of unresponsive communist rule had resulted in a general aversion toward politics for many Eastern Europeans, and that there has been very low voter turnout since their conversion to democracy. As people find that their government is unresponsive to their input, they frequently withdraw from politics. At the same time, many workers and farmers felt that the government should continue to provide for their well-being as it had done throughout their socialist lifetimes. The sudden disappearance of governmental subsidies for food, fuel, housing, transportation, communication, education and health care and such makes for economic uncertainty. The reforms of the new democratic governments must quickly produce growth, otherwise the citizens may decide that the new government is also unresponsive to the needs of the people and that it also is incapable of producing needed changes. As it is said, the second election within a new democracy is often more difficult to obtain than is the first. Throughout the last four generations, the people of Eastern Europe have lived under four different types of government. The best hope for stable democracy is for the people to relearn tolerance, compromise, trust in government, pragmatism, flexibility in goals, and moderation over extreme partisanship. These are some of the characteristics of the people living in a successful democracy. How do you rate the level of these things in the people of your own nation today? How do you feel today about the responsiveness of your own government to your demands for change and improvement? After the Eastern European nations obtained their independence from foreign controllers for the first time in decades or centuries, and mostly in bloodless transitions, such as the Czech Republic's Velvet Revolution of 1989, people were very happy to once again be controlling their own nation and its destiny, and believed that the present and the future were bright and full of promise. The heroes of the process were dissidents, poets, artists, and other intellectuals, not warriors and generals. Here is a propaganda video from North Korea about Kim Jong-il. For an authoritarian state to be accepted as the natural form of government, it is required that the citizens have more faith in a powerful leader than they do in their fellow citizens, and they must lack suspicion of authority and view their ruler as a helpful parent who earns respect and obedience. The people must prefer to mute social criticism to shun those who have views that differ from the majority. 
shun conflict over order, and keep quiet rather than disrupt society. If a people's king and queen have always ruled with a single but caring voice, then those people will feel that the only form of government that is natural and right is one ruled by a king and queen, not a democratic blending of views that partially satisfies everyone. Societal decisions are left to the king and queen to make. Citizens of a kingdom say, I don't worry about any societal issues, such as rights or incomes, because it is the king's job to take care of those things. The various nations and peoples of the earth do not have the same form of government, nor do they agree on the exact societal role of government. Each of us feels that the only correct form of government is that in which we grow, no matter if it was a band, chieftain, kingdom, theocracy, aristocracy, or democracy. This is said to comprise the political culture of a people. Lucian Pyle says that culture resides in the personalities of each person who has grown up in that culture and that our personality is the sum of our life experiences. It is hard to change a given personality because it is hard to change the sum of a person's life experiences. Culture is not a vague feeling for historical tradition. It is part and parcel of our personalities. Cultural change, like personality change, involves true trauma. Our learned cultural view of the correct world is resistant to change. Today's Western ideas of personal freedom and individual liberty came as a response to a lack of specific freedoms during the recent centuries of the European past. This short list of demanded freedoms is also a short but important itemized list of the past intrusions and abuses of kings and queens to which counter responses have been codified into law. That other regions of the world did not suffer these specific injustices from their own political leaders is an example that historical circumstance and the cultural background of a people play a large part in the type of government that each group of people feel is natural. Each person is naturally adept at recognizing injustice in every form. We have been doing this for millions of years before today's governments and religions came into existence and made it seem as if they recently invented these safeguards. Where a person from the US might say, that action violates my freedoms, an Islamic person might say, that action is un-Islamic. Notice that it is ethnocentric arrogance for a person from a democracy to think that the people of every nation want to be just like them and will happily resort to armed rebellion today to discard their so-called wrong, non-democratic system. Similarly, no foreigner can tell another group to abandon their wrong culture or to exchange their farming ways for industrialization. It is not the case that the people of every nation want to be democratic industrialists and be just like Americans. Everyone wants to continue their well-working ways. The form of government chosen by each group of persons is a result of their own cultural and historical heritage. One nation cannot impose their own form of government onto another group of people because that imposed government will lack legitimacy. 
even in a military occupation lasting throughout a generation. As soon as those people are no longer forced into submission, they will break free, as occurred when foreign-imposed communist rule vacated Eastern Europe. Now that we have seen some aspects of a single-party state, let's have a closer look at democracy to see what it is and to see which aspects of a people's culture and history will make democracy a suitable and stable type of government for them. Democracy is more than elections and voting and more than free speech and civil liberties. Democracy is, first of all, a blending of views that partially satisfies everyone. While single-party states outlaw all points of view that are contrary to those of the ruling person or party, democratic nations have multiple parties and groups who propose policy and then conduct debate and compromise until a consensus is constructed. The process involves political parties, interest groups, and members of the media, elite, military, business, religious, university, labor, property class, radical left and right, centrist, environmental, scientific, families and professionals, but rarely the poorest of us. The elite of a nation consists of its most prominent individuals, including lawyers, doctors, journalists, intellectuals, and politicians, along with its religious and business leaders. Within each group, there is a range of viewpoints. With each of the following statements about democratic culture, decide if it describes the people of your nation. Citizens of a democratic culture have tolerance for different views and lifestyles and believe in the right of dissent. Undemocratic citizens might instead accuse dissenters of being unpatriotic. While the citizens of a monarchy have a confidence in benevolent kings and queens, the members of a democracy must distrust power and instead trust in the motives and intelligence of fellow citizens. Democratic citizens have an ever-watchful attitude toward authority rather than blind submission or a fatalistic acceptance of the actions of the leaders and the rules of the state. Citizens have an intelligent distrust of leadership, but they are not hostile toward it. Authority must be questioned and challenged so that it does not become dictatorial, but it must also be supported or it will dissolve. Because of this distrust, power is spread and balanced among the branches of government and among many persons within each branch. This also means that the views, priorities, and agenda of no single person or group can monopolize the actions of the government. Much of daily politicking, including public statements and television ads, consists of the attempt to persuade a sufficient number of others that a specific action should be taken by the nation. Daily politicking has become the science of getting one's way. Democratic citizens believe that the state is responsive to their requests, but they must participate in the debate before they can measure the responsiveness of their system. The more involved are the citizens, the stronger will be their democracy. Democracy is most appropriate and durable in a nation whose citizens have a working level of knowledge in politics and who participate in political affairs, form political opinions and then express them through participation in public debates and organizations. Consider education for all to be beneficial to the nation as a whole. Desire economic development. Have political beliefs and attitudes rather than apathy toward everything political. Have a belief in the legitimacy of the state. Have any personal trust for the other members. Do not view government as a caring and trusted parent or as an institution that has the divine right to rule. Have goals for the nation. 
reject revolutionary change and instead use the existing system to make changes. Want to cooperate and compromise rather than suffer civil war and have trust in their mutually beneficial system and gain enough personal satisfaction from its existence to support it while it is temporarily performing poorly. For example, during an economic recession. Restraining one's ideology allows results to occur, otherwise there is nothing but deadlock. It is undemocratic behavior for citizens to feel that they can demand their own way, be uncompromising, and require that everyone be just like them or else. Compromise makes all parties partial winners rather than having clear winners and clear losers. We see that within dictatorial or single party states, a single person or party controls governmental plans and actions, while in democracies, Plans develop through the gelling of consensus after an open debate of the views of all persons and groups. Democracy is more than voting and free speech. It is a blending of views that partially satisfies each person and group. Citizens are their own bosses and critics. Citizen critics loudly judge the performance of their government in socialization, education, economic growth, social reform, the maintenance of law and order, its respect for the rules of the game, and its ability to govern invisibly and to achieve legitimacy. How well do you rate the level of performance of your own government today? Chinese civilization is 5,000 years old. Confucianism began 2,500 years ago, around 500 BC during a time in which many states were fighting and the empire was collapsing. Confucianism encourages one to support the existing social order and to be loyal to the ruler. If children learn to respect older siblings and parents then, as they become adults, they will naturally respect the leaders of the village and of the nation. In this way, Political and social order develop naturally from the proper behavior of the family. Confucius taught that society consists of fathers, brothers, friends, layers of bosses, and the sovereign. Mencius said that the character of a ruler is shown by the well-being of the people and that the people are important, not the ruler. It was believed that the main concern of politics should be people and that it was best to leave decisions up to the leader rather than having open political competition. There is a long history in China of viewing leaders as helpful parents. Remember also that China has usually been a single, large political unit while Europe consisted of many independent kingdoms. In the year 1300, Paris and London had populations of a few thousand persons but cities in China already had one million persons and operated through an enormous amount of daily commerce and an efficient bureaucratic system based on merit, not inheritance. Ambrose King discusses the transition from an authoritarian to a democratic regime in the socially and economically successful Republic of China on the island of Taiwan, which is shown here in red. At the end of World War II, Mao Zedong led the communist takeover of China. Taiwan became the home of three million exiled members of the Leninist structured Kuomintang who were expelled from mainland China by Mao. The Kuomintang was led by Dr. Sun Yat-sen. During the 1960s, many persons were jailed in Taiwan for trying to start new political parties. At that time, the public considered these dissidents to be threats to the order of society and a threat to political stability, which we have seen to be an aspect of Confucianism. In 1986, 
president and party leader Chang Ching Ku used his personal power and prestige to call for reform and to allow the formation of new and competing political parties. This meant an end to single party politics and the beginnings of democracy. King points out that it was the leader of an authoritarian party who used no less than his authoritarian power to engineer and legitimize a democratic breakthrough. In addition, the Western educated and reform minded liberals within the party went along with him. This shows that democracy is most easily accomplished when existing leaders have a firm and forceful commitment to its existence. In Turkey in 1923, Ataturk similarly brought multi-party democracy to Turkey through a series of reforms. Richard Sasson describes the development of democracy in India through a 100-year incubation by British colonialists. The English began visiting India around the year 1600 and were trying to control it by 1750. Much of India became a colony of the British Empire in 1858 as a few thousand British officials struggled to oversee a nation of a few hundred million persons. When Indians demanded a role in their own government, the outnumbered British could hardly refuse. In response to the mutiny of 1857, Sir Bartle Frere said that it was better to have Indian grievances out in the open before discontent became disaffection. From a small start in 1858, the British increased Indian participation in elected parliamentary democracy. Including the Indians in politics was a survival reaction rather than a designed generosity. The Indian Council was initially limited in the subjects in which it could take action, and it was subject to executive veto. But the British colonialists were learning that public discussion develops legitimacy, while autocratic rule does not. Through the next nine decades, reform acts continually expanded Indian involvement in their own rule, including the direct election of all representatives throughout the last 50 years of the colony. By the time of independence in 1947, democracy had been practiced by the people of India for a few generations. Democracy had become part of their political culture. It had become ingrained into the way of thinking of its Indian practitioners. It didn't matter that in 1947, only 15% of the people in India could read. Mahatma Gandhi played a large role in the fight for India's independence from British rule. During the years 1920 to 1947, he promoted civil disobedience and nonviolence as a means of communicating political demands. Whenever a protest turned violent, it was terminated. Still today, one quarter to one half of Indians believe that work and business stoppages, political fasts, and sit-ins are legitimate forms of political behavior. The hero of Indian independence is a pacifist, not a warrior or a general. The people of India practice all the elements of democracy. They have multiple parties that debate to a consensus in Parliament. The public shows interest in politics and forms opinions about political and public matters. Citizens feel that voting is an important way to influence their government and feel that their vote produces results. They will elect a different party into power whenever they feel that the old party has performed poorly in keeping down prices, handling the food supply, or in fighting corruption. Indian citizens hold their government responsible for its successes and its failures. India is a successful democracy. The Constitution of India includes fundamental rights for equality before the law and freedoms for speech, assembly, association, movement, settlement, and employment. The Constitution guarantees the right to life, liberty, property, due process, free access to all public places, 
prohibition of forced labor and the right to follow and teach the values of one's own culture. In this last item we see a particular Hindu tolerance that is missing from the U.S. Constitution. Most every colonized nation won their independence from Europe in the decades following World War II. After the colonies had fought alongside their European colonizers, they then demanded that the colonizers acknowledge the hypocrisy of their relationship. In a similar way, those of us U.S. citizens who are black and returned from fighting in World War II demanded an end to the hypocrisy of our so-called separate but equal system. The World War also left the colonizers drained and no longer able to afford the expense of maintaining their territories. Much of the imperial expansion had been financed by the profits of the expansion of industry and the Industrial Revolution. The 300-year-old unjust European fashion of dominating, exploiting, and angering colonies was ending. There is nothing glorious about any empire. There has never in history been a people who wanted to be oppressed. It has never once in history worked to be a bully. And there has never once in history been a bully who understood that it does not work to be a bully. Naomi Chazen explains that European colonists in Africa set up autocratic administrations instead of democratic systems. Each colony consisted of a random mixture of people, tribes, and languages because it consisted of an arbitrary geographical area. Unlike the colonies in India, Africans were not allowed to participate in their own government. The autocrats ruled Africa for a century and then rapidly vacated within a single decade without having first given the residents of ad hoc nations any experience with democracy. After the colonial powers left, many African nations quickly reverted to autocratic rule, while democracy in India has instead had a stable and long life. But by the 1980s, the people of many African nations grew tired of dictatorial rule and began to insist on democratic rule. The peoples of the externally concocted African countries had to form themselves into nations even though they contained random mixtures of unrelated tribes. Today the citizens of each African country have successfully developed an emotional attachment to their nation and have a sense of nationalism. At the same time, people continue also to identify themselves with their village, region, and ethnic group. Remember that for hundreds of thousands of years throughout the world, including Africa, people lived in small bands of about 50 persons. Group decisions were naturally made through a discussion among family elders whose main concern was the continued smooth functioning of the mutually beneficial group. Such democracy was not invented by the U.S. or even by the ancient Athenians. It is much older than that. And we human beings invented empires and emperors only about 5,000 years ago. Authoritarian dictatorships are a more recent invention. For thousands of years before the arrival of the European colonists, the many peoples of Africa were each following their own preferred political system. Some African societies were making village decisions through public debate, and other societies, those that were based on agriculture or pastoral economies, typically had a centralized political authority in the chief, whom the people considered to be a caring parent. The chief was held accountable for the community's success and failure and could be removed from power. There were few imperialistic states in Africa, such as the militaristic Zulus and the Razvi Mutapa Empire of Zimbabwe. 
The ancient state of Egypt never tried to conquer the entire continent of Africa. Each region instead maintained local rule. The Mali and Sungai of western Sudan had a loose sort of central federation of local communities that were still very much independent. The local groups sent representatives to regional meetings where a consensus would be formed from differing views. It was said that the middle road would be found by blurring opposites. Various African societies emphasized the importance of the community over that of the individual and strongly rejected both the individualism and authoritarianism. Various societies emphasized obedience to elders, office holders, clan heads, and village chiefs. The goal of every society was a smoothly functioning society, else disorder dissolve it at everyone's expense. Remember that we innately form social systems because we all agree that we have a better life together than if we go it alone. During the Middle Ages, long before the arrival of the European colonizers, many cities in Africa had populations of 10,000 persons, including, for example, the cities of Timbuktu and Kinshasa. Islam quickly spread across northern Africa after its beginnings by Muhammad around the year 600 AD and long before the arrival of either the colonists or of the slave traders. In the 17th century, some slaves who were taken to the Americas were of the Islamic faith and so knew of Mary and Jesus before their arrival there. Around the year 1850, Europeans began subjugating the separate peoples of Africa and divided the continent into many colonies. From the start, Africans saw little reason for the complex legal system of the colonialists. The colonialists set up hierarchical administrative institutions plus coercive devices that were meant to be instruments of domination over diverse peoples. These institutions were tacked onto what the colonialists saw as an existing system of so-called big men and stressed law and order, not participation and reciprocity. An African person's social standing became linked to his or her proximity to state power. The government was both externally imposed and excessively ruling, so it earned no feeling of legitimacy. The colonies were established to promote the wealth, power, and prestige of the home country. They added territory and opened new markets for the sale of the home country's goods. They also wanted to set up a system of agricultural and mineral production meant for export. Chazen says that the vehicle of capitalism was the state rather than any private system of local entrepreneurs. Colonial officials talked of the connections between intellectual enlightenment, economic advancement, and democracy, but their subjects saw only that the reality of the imposed system was completely opposite to the presented rhetoric and vetoes. The ethnocentric colonialists told their subjects that they should be just like them. After World War II, Africans began to demand independence, self-determination, the right of a people to shape their own destiny, and to point out the injustice of foreign domination and the human indignities of colonialism. The more vocal the call for democratic participation, the more vocal also was the rejection of colonialism, imperialism, and capitalism. The largest amount of violence occurred in those nations where the withdrawal of the colonialists was most prolonged, including Zimbabwe, Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau. Through the years 1950 to 1980, every African nation won its independence.
Before independence, the colony of India had 100 years of experience and involvement with a democratic system. In contrast, the African colonies had one century of experience with nothing but an authoritarian system that sometimes talked of democracy. During the independence struggle in Africa, democratic activities were being used to protest the authoritarian system, but not to build tolerance and consensus. As the European colonists were vacating African nations, hasty agreements created democratic and representational governments in each nation. Most colonies simply agreed to anything that might result in the quick withdrawal of the colonists. But democracy was not in the recent experience of the ad hoc national entities and was not embedded in the political institutions or in the political culture of the citizens. The new democratic constitutions were viewed as alien systems from a foreign culture and democracy was considered a sudden and revolutionary change. The citizens saw no benefit and did not want to be revolutionized. The independence leaders were typically elected to be the first leaders of the new nations, but after the election, these leaders had little vested interest in perpetuating the democratic system. Within a year of independence, the leaders of all but two African nations became authoritarian. No foundation for political competition existed. The new leaders quickly learned to strangle opposing views, to harass or expel their opponents, and to outlaw all other political parties, thus forming single-party states. These authoritarian leaders said that by discarding the alien democracy, they were promoting the re-Africanization of the continent's government. The expansion of the state also made the leaders extremely wealthy amid a growing poverty. For the years 1960 through 2004, here is a plot of life expectancy figures shown by the height of each nation. The colors become more red when life expectancy drops, or more white when it rises from one year to the next. War, drought, and AIDS are painfully apparent. By the 1980s, most nations were in economic, social, and political crises. The official agencies could not perform even the most essential tasks. Scarce resources often ended up in the hands of officials who were diverting public funds Social, medical, and educational services were deteriorating. Many nations had food shortages and basic necessities were unavailable. Such situations resulted in a visible decrease in the power and in the legitimacy of the state. Decrees were simply ignored as people realized the regime's incapacity to govern. Many persons were more occupied with the daily search for needs than with devising a new form of government. There were 50 coup d'etats in Africa in 20 years. Civil war occurred most often in those nations where the influence of various social groups was seen to be as strong as that of the state itself. The intolerant absence of a willingness to compromise with other views led to civil war in many nations. Civil war, coupled with drought, brought horrific famine to some countries. Civil war would typically last 20 years until people decided that compromise was better than continued war and its daily death and destruction. After about a generation of experience with the unjust authoritarian replacements for the previously authoritarian colonial governments, people were ready to once again consider democracy. Grassroots movements emerged to promote democracy as the people began to campaign against unbridled state power. The new call for democracy was coming from the people. As democracy was once again put into place, the citizen critics held the state responsible for its results and judged its performance in improving the well-being of the people. 
in the protection of civil rights, the promotion of equitable distribution, the administration of justice, and in the reduction of waste, corruption, and exploitation. The people now directly attribute depressed situations to the actions of the government and are aware of the pervasiveness of the state in their daily life. Citizens are no longer content with rulers who enrich themselves at public expense. Such attitudes are the beginnings of a strong democracy. During the 1980s, many Latin American nations switched from authoritarian or military dictatorships to civilian and democratic governments. Since 1990, there has been an increase in the number of democracies in the world. Larry Diamond explains that ruling groups can largely determine the character and pace of democratization but the resulting democracy is stable only if the masses are committed to it. Notice that the long-established democracies continuously change because social, economic, and generational changes produce new interest groups. The groups must be listened to or they might topple the democracy because democracy requires flexibility or it crumbles. Some national governments are becoming dangerously inflexible due to ties with corporate and political interest groups. These nations include Italy, Japan, Israel, and the U.S. The political system is another aspect of a people's culture. The form of government that each person believes to be natural is that which existed during his or her childhood. This aspect of our culture cannot be instantly altered. It usually takes longer than a generation. For this reason, the successors of the George W. Bush administration must operate under the realities of political culture as they try to externally impose democracy where it has not already been ingrained in culture, which was the difference between India and Africa's transition to democracy. While campaigning for president in the year 2000, George W. Bush said that foreign policy is easy just stop doing things that make other nations mad at us. He was referring to 50 years of U.S. support for any national leader who was anti-Soviet, no matter what sort of dictators were supported. The priority of U.S. foreign policy was to suppress communism at all costs. This hurt the image of the U.S., created many enemies, and played a role in much misery and death in many nations. In the last 50 years, U.S. forces have conducted war in about one of four nations of the world. This made a lot of the world's people mad at the U.S. In the book, Understanding Central America, Booth and Walker present a recipe for successful U.S. foreign policy that is designed to build and strengthen within each nation the elements of successful democracy including the blending of views through compromise, increasing the number of interest groups and political parties, building the generational commitment to democracy, increasing public participation in their government, and in choosing goals and priorities. They recommend that U.S. foreign policy pursue progress that supports genuine social, economic, and political development based on grassroots majority participation. U.S. foreign policy should promote equality and social justice. If it does otherwise, then it makes people mad at the U.S. It should stop dumping money on pro-U.S. regimes, regardless of their behavior, and stop underwriting large export-based development projects that involve only large corporations and mostly benefit the wealthiest members of the nation, while increasing inequality and hence unrest. This results in a leadership more responsive to foreign business interests than to its own people. And this does not improve the well-being of the general population. 
when a U.S. corporation enters the nation and only increases the hardship of the citizens, then those citizens get mad at the U.S. intrusion. The people who are suppressed by a government seen to be financially supported by the U.S. get mad at the U.S. for playing a role in their continued hardship that might otherwise end. Booth and Walker further recommend that better foreign policy would instead assist small producers, peasant cooperatives, worker-owned enterprises, and labor-intensive activities geared toward local and regional markets rather than capital-intensive enterprises. To be most effective, aid money should be channeled through organizations experienced in grassroots economic development. We form government to coordinate our mutual efforts at making life better for all of us and to organize numbers of persons greater than that of our innate band of 50 or so persons. To form a quick characterization of how well a government is performing in recent decades for its citizens, look at some social and economic health indicators. These things measure the success of a government in promoting the well-being of its citizens. For the last 5,000 years, each of the political units of the world have been independent, sovereign, and selfish entities that were answerable to no others. Relations between states have been a matter of power politics. There has been a recent surge in the number of democracies in the world, but this has not been accompanied by an increase in the democracy between democratic states. Today. Business is global, while government is not at all. Global corporations cannot be managed by any single country. Many other issues are larger than one nation. A single nation cannot pass laws to stop the causes of acid rain, eradicate a particular disease, regulate the Internet, conduct law enforcement, or manage the natural resources of the world. There has been a recent globalization of financial and production systems with the result that even the most powerful nations can no longer control their own economy because internal adjustments can be canceled by external reactions. Third world nations have long been familiar with external influences on internal affairs but this comes as a recent shock to so-called powerful nations. There is a new international challenge to democracy to find global approaches to global issues. These global approaches will involve all of us because the issues affect all of us. Within the book Contemporary Political Philosophy, edited by Gooden and Petit, Author David Held explains the need for democratic nations to form a democratic assembly of equals to coordinate efforts on global issues. This is not a single world government, but a single cooperation among the world's governments on the issues that require this global cooperation. Culture is local. Everyone prefers local government on local issues, but global issues can be solved only in a global manner. We will continue to have local institutions within a global superstructure, but there is much to be gained by pulling global resources on large projects. 
The specific inadequacies of the old style independent nation means adjustments are going to occur. David Held says that the United Nations would be close to filling the need, but the Superpower Security Council veto has left the UN in the power politics world of old style, independent, selfish, sovereign nations.